Thank you very much for giving me a chance to know more about you. It's really a pleasure. upbringing like as a child? Well, first of all, I was born only four years after the end of the Second World War, which uh, made an imprint on everybody who lived in the USSR at that time. My father was in the army during the whole war and ended up in Berlin and then returned to the Soviet Union to complete his education. He was a civil engineer. And naturally, lots of Soviet cities were in ruins in different places of the western part of the Soviet Union. So he was sent first to Riga, then to Ukraine. And uh, so I had to go when I was just born. And as a baby, I had to travel with my parents a lot. But then family settled in Moscow. And I would say uh, it was a normal life of a normal average boy at that time. It, was a hard time in the country. People were quite poor, but we managed by and large, you know, I wouldn't say that at that age I was in any way different. Well, maybe perhaps what was a little bit different, I learned to read very early and I was really fond of reading. That was my hobby, if you could say that about mm -hmm. a boy in this age. So this eventually, this reading, you know, I was not guided by anybody. In fact, I found the nearest public library myself, you know, in the near in the neighborhood where I live and I went there and at first my reading was random but eventually uh, I ended up reading lots of popular science books and that eventually brought me to physics. Did you always want to do physics? I wouldn't say so, no. When I was about 14 years old, a new math teacher came to our class and she was so enthusiastic about math and she would bring interesting problems which I have never heard of uh, or re uh, saw in textbooks. And it was really, really contagious. I was lucky to have a fantastically good math teacher. She was a woman and at that time when I was 14, I thought that she's probably very old, but in fact, now I realized that probably she was in her 40s. So, but she was so enthusiastic about mathematics and her lessons were so incredibly interesting. And each time she tried to bring some new problem, which is a little bit non-standard and to, to make students look from, you know, different angle. So I got charmed with her, you know, and I started reading books about popular mathematics. You know how much it in principle it means a lot for a boy or a girl at this age to meet a teacher who is really enthusiastic about his or her sub. So first I started reading uh, popular math books, which I could find in my modest library. And then uh, from popular math, I switched or more or less migrated smoothly to popular physics. And then I started reading, you know, science fiction, which was extremely popular in the 60s in the Soviet Union, which also ignited my imagination. And that's how I decided that that's my area of interest in the future, math or physics. So I was hesitating almost till the end of the school, but then an event happened which convinced me to go into physics. And this event was the release of the Russian translation of Feynman's lectures on physics. You probably heard that. It was released in Russian in 1966, and I read it. In fact, many pages or many sections of these books is just are just poetry. I read it as 
he's so poetic about physics and so incredibly, you know, I don't even know how to say. I mean, I realize that this is probably a very unusual textbook, but that really fits what I was uh, doing myself and my education. So after I, I read all, in Russian it was in 10 volumes. In Eng the English was, I think, in three volumes, but in Russian they split it in 10. I read them all 10 within a few months and mm -hmm. I decided that I will, after all, I will go after physics. What can you tell me about the penguin mechanism and sigma models? These papers, which are now called the, the Penguin Mechanism, this was my first large research project during my graduate in my graduate school. You see, I was a graduate student in the middle of the graduate school. I entered the graduate school in 1972, just after the discovery of the renormalizability of the young Mills theory. So I was a little bit late to the very beginning of the young Mills theories and QCD, but I was in the grad school at very, very lucky time, at the time when the world was rethought in terms of the quarks and gluons and in the framework of quantum chromodynamics. There were many, many issues with experiments which existed at that time, which mm -hmm. had no solutions for years, and then all of a sudden people started thinking about what is the fact or experiment would look like if we reformulate it in, in terms of these new theories. So this was a very lucky moment in my life. I mean, probably the happiest moment of my life. So we started thinking on various various puzzles which had been in existence before QCD, before the standard model. And this was one of them, the so-called the rule of delta T equal one half for no good reasons, weak decays, flavor changing, which for the first generation can proceed in with the change of isotopic spin either by one half or by three halves. For no good reasons, the probability of one half change in decays was grossly enhanced, mm -hmm. uh, strongly enhanced to those of three halves. And uh, there were some work, for instance, by Gaillard and collaborators, Mary Kay Gaillard and collaborators, which were in the right direction, but they didn't solve the problem. So my kind of uh, elder colleagues who were my informal supervisors, Weinstein and Zaharov, told me that it would be very nice to look into this problem. And we started working on it together and then came up with the discovery of a new class of diagrams mm -hmm. which have not been existed and were not thought of previously, which are intrinsically almost by definition are delta T equal one half. So also it became known from Leutwiller's work with the light quarks are re really light. The, the masses of the light quarks are like a, a, around 5 MeV, which enhances strongly this delta I equal one half uh, amplitude. Yeah. So we combine new QCD graphs with this Leutwiller's observation of the lightness of quarks and came up with the possible mechanism, which exclusively QCD-based mechanism, which is could be responsible for this enhancement. Then, of course, you probably heard the story. Accidentally, by an accident, it, it got a name of Pentium mechanism. The name was given, you know, the story by John Ellis at CERN, CERN, who was playing darts with one of his colleagues, and they met, make a bet that the one who loses puts a word, some arbitrary word, penguin, in the name of this, you know, in, in, the, in this story of this diagram. So John Ellis lost the game, and then he came home, redrawn the basic diagram which we invented, which we will uncover, redrawn it in a way that it looked similar to a penguin, and thus he fulfilled the, I mean, the obligations due to his lost bet. 
Uh, then later on, of course, uh, with new heavy quarks discovered, turned out that the same mechanism is responsible for many flavor changing transitions in the standard model. You know, I would say at this time I was very lucky in my life. This was just very lucky that a problem was revealed which could be solved so efficiently within quantum chromodynamics and within just newly emerging standard model. And okay. I was participating in this solution. It must be a good feeling. You know, you can contribute something. Yeah, it was very meaningful to me. You know, I was very young at that time. Well, in 74, well, I was not even, I was not even 20, 20, around 25. And the feeling, you know, that you can do something which was important. Of course, I didn't realize the full consequences of this, but at that time, and in general, I was, that, as I said, that was basically my first published paper. And uh, by the way, we struggled a lot in order to get it published. You know, the first we published a very short version in a Russian journal and then prepared a longer version in English and sent it to nuclear physics. And it was rejected by the first referee, second referee, and the third referee because I don't know why, but it happens with some new ideas. Yes. So we were desperate and the more so it took a lot of time because, you know, in Soviet Union where there were all sorts of restrictions with in communications with foreigners. So each letter abroad, even on such topic, had to get had to get clearance from various offices. So it would take a lot of time. So the whole story lasted for two years. So after the third referee, we I, I or we applied. We apply to the editor of uh, physics letters, I, uh, of this, uh, nuclear physics. I think at that time, one of the editors was David Gross, and he looked into the paper and uh, okayed its publication. So if that was indeed David Gross, I would like to tell him, to say thank you to him half a century, almost a century later. You wrote a book about Lev Landau. Can you tell us about it? Well, it's not that I wrote, completely wrote this book. I wrote only an extended introduction and then it's largely a collection. You see, Lam Lev Landau played a special role in Soviet physics because he created, he was not just an outstanding physicist, he created a school of physics and he created like, a, you know, a group of his students who were, for them, he was, a, well, it's something like a group of knights serving a king. Uh, they were knights and he was the king and they knew that they were doing something very important. You know, in Soviet Union, life was not easy and uh, there were not so many physicists that therefore without this unity which he created, it would be very hard to catch up with the world physics. So he was a father of many children, many faithful children. So I collected the recollections. It's a book about Landau and his disciples, you know, disciples, I don't know how to say, and about his students and close collaborators. Each uh, story is told by a former student or close collaborator. So it's not only about Landau, it's about his school. And there, there are stories about Landau, about important discoveries which had been made by himself and by his students. It also carries the imprint of time. You know, Landau, he died in 1968, but uh, he stopped doing physics in 1962 after a terrible accident which happened. Uh, it's a road accident that happened to him. He was nearly killed and for a long time it was not clear whether he'd survive and all his students uh, try to help as hard as they could in getting med special medications, uh, finding the best doctors. After 1962, he didn't do any physics. So basically this time when Landau was active with, uh, and he started uh, doing physics, he became already famous in mid-1930s. At this time, he was, he really believed 
in his strength, you know, and he realized himself as a future leader of a group. He was also very active politically. He was very devoted to the communist idea. And this lasted for some year, for a number of years, until he was, in 1938, he was arrested by Soviet political police and accused of anti-Soviet activities. He was imprisoned for a year. And normally, usually under these circumstances, uh, people who were arrested by political police were, would be short or killed to one of the Gulag camps, which was almost the same. But very miraculously, Landau was saved by his friend, Pyotr Kapitze, another outstanding Soviet physicist and Nobel Prize winner, who was in high esteem among the Soviet authorities. So... Kapitza wrote a letter to Stalin about the fate of uh, Landau, and miraculously this letter had been read. It was read, and in this letter Kapitza promised to Stalin that he will look after Landau and won't allow him to indulge in any, in any kind of political activities. So, very fortunately for Soviet physics, he was released from prison in a year. Exactly, he spent exactly a year and he was in the state of complete exhaustion after that but eventually okay he recovered so the good thing that he recovered and started doing physics again of course secretly in his mind he changed his admiration to the socialist or communist idea if you want he became quite a devoted anti-communist but he could never tell a single word of this change of his change of mind so it it only became clear much, much after, basically, in the times when so after the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1990s, some of testimonies of his friends show that there was a dramatic change. So it also was the time of the nuclear bomb. You know, the Soviet Union started working on the nuclear bomb more or less formally in 1942 during the Second World War. But actually, the serious research started only after the war in Soviet Union. And Landau, as many other theoretical physicists, were summoned to a team who was supposed to create Soviet nuclear bomb. Landau, by the way, he didn't work too hard in the sense that I know it from my PhD advisor who was also was a very young man. He was a part of this team. And he told me that Landau, unlike many others, he was not enthusiastic. He would carefully do what he was asked to do, but he never showed any initiative for which is maybe understandable given the circumstances. But nevertheless, this is the time when physicists were very needed to the country in order to create a nuclear bomb. Landau was a part of the team. It was a very taken extremely seriously. I heard from Zeldovich, you probably heard this name, it was a very great, uh, he was a very important player in this team. You know, he was maybe one of the leading two or three of those those who really did things, did big things. But then he retired from, from this and became a very famous astrophysicist who predicted many effects. And I heard from him that they all knew that if the first test of the Soviet nuclear bomb will fail, they all, all of the participants, they would be sent to Gulag. So it was very important for them. So, so in this book, okay, his students and his close collaborators just tell their stories of interactions with Landau, of their life, lives in the 1950s mostly, a little bit in the 1960s. It is, it is not, not uh, just only for scientists, I would say, to read this book. It is for more general audience because mm -hmm. it's, it has to do with the fates of important physicists or mm -hmm. even some of them became great physicists. In physics, what would you say was your biggest achievement? If you do some works, I mean, if you invest a lot of time and effort and thinking and rethinking, these works are like children to you, you know, so it's very hard if you have 
a few children. I know you have a daughter, but let's say you had three daughters. I think it would be very hard to say which one is loved most, you know. You love and love all of your children. But if I try to look back and estimate or decide what works now, after so many time, I appreciate more than others. I would say, first of all, it's a group of works which I did just after my PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mentioned already the penguin mechanism. After that, there were a work, it's called QCD Some Rules, rather awkward name, but it's a very broad work on determining how the properties of various hadrons can be determined from the knowledge of a few condensates, uh, like the gluon condensate or the quark condensate, which emerge in QCD as a result of the strong interactions. It's not a full solution uh, of the theory, as you know, QCD is very special, it's confining, but it was historically the first, probably, attempt to relate properties of the QCD vacuum with the properties of hadrons. We worked on this paper or this series of papers for maybe a couple, almost a couple of years without publishing anything. And then we collected all our results in, in three papers and sent them to nuclear physics. And they appeared in one and the same issue of nuclear physics. And that was all. There was nothing else in this issue. It was the whole volume, not the volume, the whole release of nuclear physics and we're containing our three works. So it, it was very entertaining, uh, you know, to work on that. This was never, I mean, this issue has never been thought of before. A lot of efforts went, so it's very memorable to me. Then, you know, some works which uh, became kind of important, they appear just in a day or two with no visible effort, just come out of blue. So there was invisible Axion paper, which the work on it was not that long. And then there was another example of a, of a work which uh, was carried out in collaboration with various people, with my usual collaborators, uh, Weinstein, and with uh, Kolya Uralsov, who, is unfortunate, who has unfortunately died. Mm -hmm. And Misha Valoshin, who also has unfortunately died. It's about heavy quark uh, symmetry and expansion in the inverse uh, heavy quark mass, which created a large uh, flux of the subsequent papers. This is the first part of my career. The second mm -hmm. part started when I learned supersymmetry, which is oh. absolutely fascinating, and that happened in early 1980s. And mm -hmm. here here, my colleagues, Kadi Weinstein, Pali Zaharov, sometimes also Viktor Novikov and I, we figured out how to get at least some exact results. Mm -hmm. Exact means sometimes to all orders in perturbation theory, sometimes totally exact in four-dimensional field theories. Before us, there was only one paper uh, by Witten and collaborators who uh, extracted such a exact results in, uh, in three-dimensional supersymmetric field theory. But as far as four dimensions are concerned, this were the first exact results, the beta function calculated of the beta functions of the gluino condensate and some other things. Now it's, of course, more or less standard because shortly, uh, you know, a new era started when people realized the power of supersymmetry mm -hmm. in solving uh, some problems from strong coupling, like uh, Zyberg and Witten solution came in 94, even before that, Zyberg, Affleck, and uh, Dyne superpotential was derived. So later, a few years later, it, was be it became a powerful direction in supersymmetric field theories, but uh, when we were working on it, uh, 1981, 1982, 1983, it was like a club of three or four people, that's it.
can you tell us about your book, The Quantum Field Theory? Yeah, I wrote this book, uh, Advanced Topics in Quantum Field Theory, which was issued in uh, 2012, and now soon the second edition will appear. I would say that in part it's a diary, but it's not a personal diary, but a diary of, of my research during my whole career. When I was doing various problems from various areas of theoretical high energy physics, of course, when you do research, some things are at the level of the research, so you put in your research paper and publish it, but while you are doing something, you have some thoughts which kind of, you know, side remarks or something which is uh, maybe known already to many people, Mm -hmm. but you somehow realized it in a little bit different way or or some known derivation, but in an unusual way, you know, you do some derivation with the result of which known to everybody, but you did it, let's say, simpler than everybody else. I was inspired by Polyakov's book, you know, Polyakov wrote one book, I think he, he authored only one book, but if you read the preface on the book, that's exactly what he did. He collected some things on, on which he was, he thought in due time, but they didn't make it to the research papers, but generally they were useful to, to students. Uh, so since my career lasted for so long, I collected a rather pile of notes, which just for my personal use, not for anybody else. And, and then at a certain point, I decided that, that there are many things which might be useful to students in this pile of notes. And uh, I organized them more or less, added a little bit more topics for to make it uh, continuous and pedagogically, you know, connected to each other. And the bit it was it is a large book you know it has 600 pages now and will have even 700 pages in the second edition but i heard from my personal students that it is very helpful and that's all i was hoping for that it will be helpful and it was fun for me to work on it although it took more time you know organizing your notes of many years in some way which could be readable to others it's a big work but okay i'm glad i did it can you tell us a bit about gluon condensation and uh, svz zam rules yeah i told you a little bit uh, when you asked me what uh, what of my work are dear to me well the idea was very simple it was 1978 i believe we had worked on this in 1978 in the very beginning of qcd which was created in 1973 and at that time most of the work devoted to QCD were perturbative QCD at large momentum transfer or at high energy. So basically, technically, it was different from QED, but uh, ideologically, it was the same. There were some important work which would show that QCD is much more than just perturbation theory. Of course, we knew that it is confining, and there, there existed already the conjecture of Oft, Mandelstam, and that uh, uh, the confinement can could be explained that there is some kind of dual Meissner effect which occurs in QCD vacuum, uh, but it was a pure it, uh, conjecture was put forward in 1975 in three uh, Nambu, uh, Tkhoff, Nambu, and Mandelstam. They put this conjecture in different, you know, not unrelated to each other papers, but it was a pure conjecture. Nobody knew how to implement it or even start thinking about it qualitatively and quantitatively and this lasted for 20 years until 1994 but in 1978 this was a total kind of exotic type of thinking so we decided that maybe okay maybe we don't know the microscopic mechanism but maybe this type of mechanism leaves its traces in the vacuum expectation value you know it's a 
microscopic approach, but if something condenses in the vacuum, then there may be vacuum expectations values of something, right? So, so we decided to try with it. And of course, one condensate, the core condensate was already known from the Gelman, Oaks, and Trainer. So this was an easy part, but it only had to do with the chiral phenomena. So we started thinking what might be the purely QCD related condensate. And of course, it's pretty clear that the first in dimension is the gluon condensate. So we came to it uh, from doing some, from playing from heavy quark physics for charm, from charmonium, for charmonium, some rules for charmonium, which was a hot topic at that time. And then we realized that introducing this condensate allows one to, helps one to make some quantitative predictions about charmonium. For instance, at that time, experimentalists claimed that they invented, that they detected the so-called X boson, which they believed was paracharmonium. Mm -hmm. And they knew the mass difference, mass difference between charmonium and this X particle or paracharmonium, para which they believed it was. And we did a calculation, including the gluon condensate, and, and uh, said this cannot be true. And we published this result, and they did uh, a few months later, data change, and they don't doubt that this zero pseudoscalar charmonium, its mass was high, somewhat higher, and uh, the prediction which we made was correct, a correct prediction. And then with this knowledge in hand, we said, why don't we consider all the world of the basic hadronic mesons and maybe even baryons and see what happens if we combine both condensates, the quark and, and the gluon condensate. So, and of course, it's not a microscopic the description of the theory, but uh, remember it was 1978. We got, uh, we considered lot of lots and lots of different particles in all possible channels, Romeson, Omega me meson, and F mesons, and all sorts of mesons, a little bit about protons uh, and neutrons. You know, these two or three numbers which we introduced ad hoc led to a full picture of the full zoo of the resonance uh, properties. So we were inspired, of course, Later on, you know, now, for instance, of course, there are much more powerful tools, like, for instance, latest calculation, finally, especially with quarks, that's what we needed, finally got up and uh, achieved very good, uh, very good accuracy and are used. But still, there are some applications which is hard to deal with on the latest, and uh, like, for instance, form factors or something, you know, everything which can be ca calculated from the... Euclidean space, of course, is more precisely now done on the lattices than it used to be in 78, 79, but there are some quantities which carry some Minkowski features, you know, and for such quantities, modifications of the sum rules are still useful. What would you like to see come out of future particle accelerators? Well, I would like to see at least one accelerator of the next generation. I would say it's even tragic that LHC, which was the hope of the whole community for years, only found the Higgs particle and that the place where it is expected to be. And so far, no new insights to new physics, no new wind windows of opportunity open. So this created uh, serious problems in the community because physics, to my mind, it's now maybe not a, it used to be the general perception, now it is not. To my mind, physics can develop only as long as it is based on experiment. You know, we cannot invent out of blue something which uh, we have never observed or 
and will probably never be able to observe in the future. I think it would be a little bit too much to assume that human beings would be able to invent something with no hint from the nature and this something will be discovered in nature. Because always in the past, physics was based on the hints from the nature, right? All new discoveries were obtained because in nature something would tell us that, look, this and this happens. What do you think about it? How this can be explained? And if you can explain it, can you develop it a little bit further and see what new predictions are and, and check these new predictions? Now in high energy physics, of course, there are still some indirect experiments like the recently, you know, released uh, news of the, that in mu on G minus two, there is a four sigma deviation from the standard model, which is very great and if that is true this would be a great you know impetus for theory and at least it will give hope that something beyond the standard model is within reach but uh, also a lot of influx of new data from the outer space from about you know cosmology thrives and uh, astrophysical data continue to appear but in high energy physics properly it looks like the existing an accelerator is already exhausted. I don't want to say here I would dream that something new would appear, but it seems that it won't. What advice can you give to future researchers? Well, this is a hard question because it depends on the way physics, especially high energy physics, particle physics, how it will continue. But a general advice to young physicists that young physicists, especially young theorists, should begin their career from going into something new, you know, because when a young man or a young woman goes in his or her research in some new topics, this is the most inspiring thing. And so this creates an atmosphere of, you know, excitement, of exuberance and this is the way to proceed for uh, in the beginning of one's career you know like it happened with me when i came to grad school that was the era of qcd and the standard model and data were coming almost on a monthly basis but uh, then of course one one should make one's mind you know up to what extent the topic under discussion up to what extent it is physics, you know, because many topics currently which grew from physics, now they became pure math. There is nothing wrong in doing pure math, but one should understand that going in this di direction, one cuts off the roots because disconnects oneself from physics. So if you want to do physics, I think you should set, the or young researchers should set the limit. Physics is still a, a broad science, you know, okay, in high energy physics, now there is no influx of data or very little data income. But there is astrophysics, there is cosmology, lots of research at the borderline between high energy physics and condensed matter physics with all its new phase transition discovered. Uh, field theory is still a very powerful theory, you know, and new discoveries happen. Like recently there were new anomalies, new class of anomalies discovered. And some other things. And finally, I would uh, encourage young people not to isolate themselves. So you see, it's much better if you work in a group of similar minded people. Some geniuses can survive without any connection to anybody else. Like for instance, Dirac. He very rarely he had any collaborators. He liked to think and to work all by himself. This happens, but by and large, a uh, kind of regular young physicist needs an uh, infusion of enthusiasm from a set, from a group of people who are thinking the same way, looking into similar problems. This supports, this is a very great uh, support for a means of being successful in, in the work. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I hope it's gonna be okay. Yeah. No. There is
That's all. It'd be good because of all these disconnections, there might be some gaps. If you need something. Okay. It was, yeah. yeah. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? So, how are you? Uh, I hope it's uh, <laughs> now. <laughs> Sure. I can, can you can you hear me? With the COVID thing. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Oh, it's maybe, maybe you prefer to switch to Zoom or something? Sometimes, but I can hear you. Well, I don't know. This is the works. The book you mean about Landau, right?